printing everyone Raining. But the fight is all yours.
bringing blood to track his ghost by Mark Gustafs and we were like Lewis and Clark, tracing out the delicate strange dark places inside Trackle, all alone without anything from the past to guide us. So James Wright wrote to Robert Bly when, after a two-year process, 20 poems of Georg Trackle, the R.A. Mickey's. Hurry! The world is not going to get better. Do what you want to do now. The prologue is over. Soon actors will come on stage. The world is not going to get better. Advise from the geese. Hurry! Hurry! The world is not going to get better. Advise from the geese. Hurry! Advise from the geese. Geese, hurry! The world is not going to get better. Do what you want to do now. The prologue is over. Soon actors will come on stage carrying the coffin. I don't want to frighten you, but a not a stitch can be taken on your quilt unless you study. The geese will tell you a lot of crying goes on before dawn comes. Do you have a friend who has studied prisons? Does a friend say, I love the twelve houses? The word houses suggests prison all by itself. So much suffering goes on among prisoners. There's so much grief in the cells. So many bolts of lightning keep coming down from the unborn. Please don't expect that the next president will be better than this one. Four o'clock in the morning is the time to read Basilides. Every seed spends many nights in the earth. Robert, you've always been too cheerful. You, too, will not be forgiven if you refuse to study. When the water holes go and the fish flop about in the mud, they can moisten each other faintly. But it's best 
if they lose themselves in the river. You know how many Greek ships went down with their cargoes of wine. If we can't get to port, perhaps it's best to head for the bottom. I've heard that the morning dove never says what she means. Those of us who make our poems have agreed not to say what the pain is. Eliot wrote his poems for years standing under a bare light bulb. He knew he was a murderer, and he accepted his punishment at birth. The sitar player is searching now in the backyard, now in the old dishes left behind on the table, now for the suffering on the underside of a leaf. Go ahead, throw your good name into the water. All of those who have ruined their lives for love are calling to us from a hundred sunken ships. Silent in the moonlight, no beginning or end. Alone and not alone. A man and a woman lie on open ground under an antelope robe. They sleep under animal skin, looking up at the old clear stars. How many years? The robe thrown over them, rough, where they sleep. Outside, the moon. The plains, silent in the moonlight. No beginning or end. What things want. You have to let things occupy their own space. This room is small, but the green cité likes to be here. The big marsh reeds, crowding out the slow, find the world good. You have to let things be as they are. Who knows which of us deserves the world more? Oh well, let's go on eating the grains of eternity. What do we care about improvements in travel? Angels sometimes cross the rivers on old turtles. Should we worry about who gets left behind? That one bird flying through the clouds is enough. Her sweet face at the door of the house is enough. The two farm horses stubbornly pull the wagon. The mad cows carry away the tablecloth. Most of the time, we live through the night. Let's not drive the wild angels from our door. Maybe the mad fields of grain will move. Maybe the troubled rocks will learn to walk. It's all right if we're troubled by the night. It's all right if we can't recall our own name. It's all right if this rough music keeps on playing. I've given up worrying about men living alone. I do worry about the couple who live next door. Some words heard through the screen door are enough.
Tell Tristan the tip of his tongue is beautiful. Tell the lovers they are blessed. Tell me my poems are promises made a thousand years ago. People who adore literature often say that fall is the best of all seasons. Erasmus loved Latin, heavy seas, masts breaking, ships going down. Twice this morning I've kissed Marvell's book. He's glad for the mourners, whose eyes are blessed by grief, who, quote, weep the more and see the less. I know that these poems mean that I am beginning to get rid of the traces. But at this rate, I'll still be washing the floor when the flood comes. Every drop of water has inside it the strange, mad longing to be the ocean. I don't need to say why every grass blade is so thin. Robert, your take on the fall is right. Those studying the Kabbalah gain so much from the story of Ruth gleaning barley stalks in the dust. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on a black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine, behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. The chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. This is called Living by the Red River, and it's one of a, a few poems I wrote that had to do with the uh, the edge of the prairie. I was up in Fargo, North Dakota. Fargo is a, a nice city of about 60,000 people. Uh, you get out the edge of it, and you're abruptly there on this tremendous prairie. Uh, living by the Red River. Blood flows in me, but what does it have to do with the rain that is falling? In me, scarlet-jacketed armies march into the rain across dark fields. My blood lies still, indifferent to cannons on the ships of imperialists drifting offshore. Sometimes I have to sleep in dangerous risk. So I wrote this one. As I step over a puddle at the end of winter, I think of an ancient Chinese governor. 
And the epigraph, two lines from Bocciui, who is standing uh, way up in the air on the rope bridge, thinking it might break. And how can I, born in evil days and fresh from failure, ask a kindness of fate? Thought you we balding old politician, what's the use? I think of you uneasily entering the gorges of the Yangtze when you were being towed up the rapids towards some political job or other in the city of Chungshou. You made it, I guess, by dark. But it is 1960. It is almost spring again, and the tall rocks of Minneapolis build me my own black twilight of bamboo ropes and waters. Where is Yan Chen, the friend you loved? Where is the sea that once solved the whole loneliness of the Midwest? Where is Minneapolis? I can see nothing but the great terrible oak tree darkening with winter. Did you find the city of isolated men beyond mountains? Or have you been holding the end of a frayed rope for a thousand years? The yellow orioles on the flowers twitter with a charming sound. A beauty with a face like jade faces them as she toys with her sounding strings. She is more than willing to play with them but these were her dearest childhood loves. The flowers fly away and the birds leave too. She spills her tears in the autumn wind. I roost and roam at the foot of cold cliff, especially amazed at its most hidden marvels. I took hamper in hand and picked mountain vegetables. I brought a basket and returned with fruit. Now in my simple lodging, I spread rushes and sit. I chew on the purple mushrooms, then wash gourd and bowl in a clear pool as I blend and simmer the thick and the thin. Basking in the sun, I sit with my robe about me, idly reading the poetry of the men of old. The places I visited in former days, now 70 years ago. No more do old friends frequent me. They're buried now in old tomb mounds. 
and now my head's already white, while I still keep to this cloud shred of hill. That is why I tell those who will come after me, why not read these words of old? I've wanted to go to East Mountain for countless years till now. Yesterday I clambered up vines, but wind and mist blocked me halfway. Hard for clothes to brave the narrow path, and clinging moss hampered by shoes. So halting beneath an osmanthus tree, I slept a while with white clouds for my pillow.
I don clothes fashioned of illusion and tread in shoes made of tortoise fur. In my hand I grasp a bow of rabbit horn planning to shoot the demons of ignorance. You've seen blossoms amid the leaves. How long will they remain fine? Today I fear someone will pluck them. Tomorrow I'll wait for them to be swept away. Lovely, this charming, seductive mood. But with the years, we grow older and older. Compare this world with these flowers. How can a rosy face last forever? Rafters of cinnamon wood, that's not my house. The pine tree forest, that's my home. A single life passes in an instant. Don't say that worldly affairs are slow to come. If you're not building a raft to cross the river, then you'll drift away because you picked flowers. If you don't plant the roots of good deeds now, when will you ever see the sprouts emerge? I've been in the world for 30 years, and I must have traveled a million miles. Walked by rivers where the green grass grows thick, and entered the frontier where the red dust arises. bit uh, melancholy and agitated, I would say. That one wasn't finished. Purified potions in vain search for immortality. 
read books and peruse read books and peruse the histories. Today I return to Cold Mountain, pillow myself on the cheek, and wash out my ears. What are you feeling right now? A dress? Harangue. Wow. The mirror of my mind. Uh, Gibbon. I don't even have Gibbon in here, but... Cicero. Ah, yes. The Brutus is, um... The history of eloquence. I think this is Darwin. Orifice. <laughs> oh no. This is a, a 19th century eugenics text. That'll that'll cheer me up. She would upon occasions treat them with freedom, yet her blank was so awful that they durst not fail in the least point of respect. Um, salary? Demeanor. Who would use Durst in their prose? Um, I'm trying to think of the oldest book I've got in here. I have no idea. Tristram Shandy? Oh yeah, Jonathan Swift. He's way overrepresented. I'm at length arrived at Japan, where there is an extreme scarcity of things, which I place amongst the blank benefits of Providence. Uh, bountiful. Wow, that is a school that reveres classical learning. Um, I'll say this is John Fletcher. Wow, this is Dryden. Now, what was Dryden doing writing about Japan? Is my uh, question. Japan at the time was probably a pretty uh, nice place. I don't know if that was the Edo period, the uh, 1700s. Maybe Edo was a bit earlier. Let's see, that was Dryden 16. That is volume 16 of Dryden's complete works. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I I guess the uh the one that demands the least of you is to be a philosopher. So, since I don't compose nor do I rule, that's all that remains.
Here it is. What is this text? Oh, wow. You know what? I think this might be... Looks like the same story that Scorsese used for Silence. Did you happen to see that movie? He cheerfully underwent the greatest hardships of poverty And writing from Japan to the fathers of Goa, his words were these, Assist me, I beseech you, dear brethren, in acknowledging to Almighty God the signal favor he has done to me. I am at length arrived at Japan, where there is an extreme scarcity of all things, which I place amongst the greatest benefits of providence. What a warped sense of, <laughs> sense of the world. Scarcity is the uh, benefit of God. Mortification is always the companion of poverty in apostolical persons. Xavier bore constantly along with him the instruments of penance, hair cloth, chains of iron, and disciplines, pointed at the ends and exceeding sharp. He treated his flesh with great severity by the same motive which obliged St. Paul the Apostle to chastise his body and to reduce it into servitude, lest having preached to other men he might himself become a reprobate. I feel I myself do suffer from not spending enough hours in the hair cloth or flagellating my reprobate flesh. At sea, the ship tackling served him for a bed. On land, a mat, or the earth itself it is like Hanshan, but less happy. He eat so little that one of his companions assures us that without a miracle he could not have lived. Another tells us that he seldom or never drank wine, unless at the tables of the Portuguese, for there he avoided singularity and took what was given him. But afterwards he revenged himself on one of those repasts by an abstinence of many days. What a hero! What is this? His interior mortification was the principle of these thoughts in this holy man. From the first years of his conversion, his study was to gain an absolute conquest on himself. And he continued always to exhort others not to suffer themselves to be hurried away by the fury of their natural desires. By the daily practice of these maxims, Xavier came to be so absolute master of his passions that he knew not what it was to have the least motion of choler and impatience, and from thence proceeded partly that tranquility of soul, that equality of countenance, that perpetual cheerfulness, which rendered him so easy and so acceptable in all companies. This reminds me a lot of uh, what we were reading here yesterday, um, namely the uh, Vasudhi Maga. And uh, what I was actually looking for in that yesterday, I didn't find. Um, so I would like to actually find it now and compare this description of Xavier and his mortifications to the Theravada Nibbana. 
uh, here described as virtue. And we'll see what we get. They certainly seem more cheerful in their mortification. I think that largely derives from the fact that they have no theism. Whereas the lowly Christians have to hold out thinking that God is peering behind a cloud or will meet them in the end times. There's a gorgeous description of virtue in here. I was lost yesterday in the first dhyana, which presupposes virtue um, and does have happiness and bliss as a result. But it's less precise about the moral qualities of virtue. Um, this whole work, this 800 page work, is an explication of this line. When a wise man established well in virtue develops consciousness and understanding, then as a behiku, ardent and sagacious, he succeeds in disentangling this tangle. So, oh, whoops, I wasn't sharing that, was I? Huh. And that was the line I just read there. Description of virtue. A tangle is a network of craving. an inner tangle and an outer tangle because it arises as craving for one's own requisites and another's internal and external bases for consciousness purification should be understood as nibbana which good old Xavier over here was uh, lashing himself with uh, mortifying himself with whips in order to achieve. Yet here, in some instances, this path of purification is taught by insight alone. He who is possessed of constant virtue, who has understanding and is concentrated, who is strenuous and diligent as well, will cross the flood so difficult to cross. It did look like Xavier had a, had a kind of a peg on that. I mean, they did say he was the master of his passions, which is a, you know, not bad start. Ardent, possessing energy. See here, they see fear in the round of rebirths. That's the uh, the motivating um, dynamic here. Rather than hell, even though they do have a hell. Okay, so we're going to get three trainings, the disposition good in three ways, 
Necessary condition for the threefold clear vision. Many trinities here. Avoiding the two extremes. Cultivating the middle way. Surmounting the states of loss. Abandoning the defilements in three aspects. Purification of the three kinds of defilements, etc., etc. For the um, the first dhyana, we had ten aspects, which came about from entry, dwelling, and. Uh, refinement? Okay, virtue, concentration, and understanding. Here, here's a good negative description of virtue. One who is virtuous has nothing to be remorseful about. Which also yesterday reading the Anu Yoga commitments uh, still leaves quite a wide range of activity to the uh, ambitious Bodhisattva. They do offer uh, super normal powers here. Um, Immovability. Seems that Xavier had something similar. The six kinds of direct knowledge. Four kinds of discrimination. Kind of laying out all the... Uh... Oh, here, see here are the three kinds of clear vision. Recollection of past lives. Knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings, which is called the divine eye. And knowledge of destruction of cankers, which the best I've been able to discern, a canker is the seed of a clasia. And a clasia is a... Um, a bad habit that causes you suffering that you can't stop. Three kinds of clear vision, six kinds of direct knowledge, knowledge of supernormal power, the divine ear, penetration of minds, recollection of past lives, cankers. Four discriminations, meaning, law, language, and intelligence. I think these are uh, footnotes to various aspects of um, the sutras. I am still looking for a uh, particular description of virtue, which... There we go. What is virtue? In what sense is it virtue? What are the benefits of virtue? How many kinds of virtue are there? What is the defiling of it? And what is the cleansing of it? Virtue as volition. Virtue as consciousness concomitant. Virtue as restraint. Virtue as non-transgression. Okay, abstain from killings and do your duties. Then you have the right volition. Consciousness concomitant is the abstinence itself. So I guess you will it, and then you are it. Virtue as volition has seven volitions that accompany the first seven of the ten courses of action.
And so the state you're in, non-covetousness, you don't want things. That's been rankling me a lot recently. I've been envious and wanting. No ill will, can't say I'm free of that either. Right view? Uh, as I said, I'm a philosopher, so I'll take pride in my right view. Okay, so abandoning covetousness. Okay, so consciousness concomitant chetasika is a collective term for feeling, perception, and formation. In other words, aspects of mentality that arise together with consciousness. Pretty wide, wide category there. Okay, virtue as restraint. Five ways. Restraint of the rules of the community. In this case, a monk sangha. The Patimoka vows. Restraint by mindfulness. You can never get enough of that. Restraint by knowledge. Patience. And energy. Okay. Restraint by mindfulness. You watch what you look at. Restraint by knowledge is the currents in the world that flow, Ajita, said the Blessed One, are stemmed by means of mindfulness. Restraint of currents, I proclaim, by understanding they are damned. Currents. I guess it, I kind of take that as dodging temptation. Okay, patience, straightforward. Energy. He does not endure a thought of sense desire when it arises. Purification of livelihood connected with that. Non-transgression. Okay, so that was a negative description of virtue. Virtue, sila, shila, in the sense of composing, shilana. What is composing? Coordinating non-inconsistency of bodily action due to virtuousness. Uh... Practice what you preach. Upholding a foundation for profitable states. The meaning of virtue is the meaning of cool. Sitala. I like the etymological derivation. They seem to have uh, considered that uh, I wanted to say Sanskrit, but I thought that this meditation manual was built on Pali. But maybe I'm not understanding this correctly. I know that Sanskrit is commonly considered a divine language. So, thereby, if you can find virtue being synonymous with a bunch of other words that are good, like cool, uh, that may uh, confirm for you you're on the right path. Okay, you can analyze it. Function of virtue as a double sense, stop misconduct, and achieve blamelessness.
virtue will appear as purity. And here we are in the realm of the ideal. The flip side of purity is conscience and shame, which seems to presume that we have an intuition of this intrinsic good. Bodily, verbal, mental comes to be apprehended as a pure state. When conscience and shame are in existence, virtue arises and persists. When they are not, it neither arises nor persists. This nice melancholic piano accompaniment. What are the benefits? Okay, non-remorse. Non-remorse as the aim, non-remorse as the benefit. Obtains a large fortune as a consequence of diligence. A fair name is spread abroad. When entering an assembly, he does so without fear or hesitation. Because he just knows how good he is. Dies unconfused. Not bad. On the breakup of the body after death, reappears in a happy destiny in the heavenly world. Huzzah! Why, hello, my friend. You have reappeared here in a happy destiny. I welcome you. I've come over to your side of the fence and now I do all my time investigating. <laughs> I still do throw throw blanks out here though. Ah. I had some rather disturbing dreams last night, which unfortunately is a rather common occurrence for me. So I uh, sympathize. I'm looking for this beautiful description of virtue. I didn't write them down. I can still see the the one I had before. It was it was very frightening. Frequently I will have frightening dreams that I wake from in in quite a tizzy. How many kinds of virtue are there? Keeping and avoiding good behavior. I think at first I had a good dream, but then I had a bad dream. 
I told a friend of mine that I frequently have bad dreams, and telling him did not thwart the next bad dream. Temporary or lifelong virtue, limited and unlimited, mundane, super mundane, inferior, medium, superior, giving precedence to self, the world, or the Dhamma, purified, unpurified, etc., etc. Yeah. It's a. Uh... It is kind of unfortunate. He was rather surprised to hear that and uh, said that most people, he thought, do not have bad dreams frequently. Through this virtuous conduct, I shall become a great deity or some minor deity. I think I'd be happy with just the minor deity status. Oh, that one actually isn't virtuous because that's dependent on craving. Well, um, it's more of a slow corrosion of life. Um, I fear that it does bespeak a deep unsettlement. Virtue subject to cankers is mundane, but not subject to cankers is super mundane. This bears comparison with um, the Summa Theologica, which is a comparison I've uh, wanted to make much of my life. Yeah, I definitely had the teeth falling out dreams. So here, here are the Catholic virtues. Here they are. Faith, hope, charity, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, and acts which pertain to certain men. Ah, yes. I don't have those as much anymore. Sometimes I do. There was a happy aspect of my dream at first last night. Uh, the 
closest I got was reading this Buddhist text, which has visionary cultivation. But I I don't recall reading many of the detailed treatises about how to take your dreams in hand. LaCroix. Orange flavored. It's my vice. Vices and sins differ in species according to matter and object. It's just sparkling water with some flavoring. We may reduce the whole of moral matters to the consideration of the virtues which themselves may be reduced to seven in number. Ah, this probably tastes similar. Do you feel that that may have disrupted your sleep? Three of these are theological virtues, which we treat first, while the other four are cardinal virtues which we teach afterwards. Of the intellectual virtues, there is one, prudence, which is included and numbered among the cardinal virtues. Art, however, does not pertain to moral science, which is concerned with things to be done, for art is right reason about things to be made. Hmm. The other three intellectual virtues, besides prudence, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, agree in name with the gifts of the Holy Ghost. That is one aspect of Christianity I missed out on, the Holy Ghost. Protestantism doesn't doesn't uh, tap into that ghostly inspiration. So we shall consider the gifts of the Holy Ghost alongside the virtues. The other moral virtues are reducible to the cardinal virtues. All right. I am not religious. I I do uh, admire Catholic theology and Thomas Aquinas, though. I spent a good deal of time studying theology. Faith itself, the object of faith, the act of faith, the outward act of faith, the virtue of faith, those who have faith, the cause and effects of faith. See, I bet if we read this, we might even see the reasonable virtue of faith. I presume you are not religious yourself either. The gifts of understanding and knowledge, and then vices, unbelief, heresy, apostasy, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and vices opposed to knowledge and understanding. And then the precepts, 
Okay, so that was that was faith, which I guess is that. So is that one of the cardinal virtues? Hope, hope in itself, the subject of hope, the gift of fear, and the opposing vices of despair and presumption. There's an interesting subject. The gift of fear and the vices of despair and presumption. Let's take a look at that. So here, here's question 19 on the gift of fear. Is God to be feared? The division of fear into filial, initial, servile, and worldly. Is worldly fear always evil? Is servile fear good? Is it substantially the same as filial fear? Does servile fear depart when charity comes? Is fear the beginning of wisdom? Is initial fear substantially the same as filial fear? We're going to have to look into what these... Uh, divisions of fear are is fear a gift of the holy ghost i also want to jump to that one does it grow when charity grows fear does it remain in heaven how about that that question does fear remain in heaven i'm gonna guess no <laughs> maybe it does though which of the beatitudes and fruits belong there we go I am terrified in my dreams. Oftentimes I'm terrified of trying to help someone else. And I'm fighting for my own life while trying to help someone else. And I can't help them. And I myself am being destroyed while they are destroyed. But thankfully, I'm going to heaven, where there may or may not be fear. We'll see. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Summa Theologica, but the way Aquinas structures his questions is he gives the objections first. One, two, and three. Then he gives an opposing view. Then he answers the question. And then he answers the three objections. It's a very dynamic form of argumentation. So objection one, it would seem that fear does not remain in heaven. For it is written in Proverbs 133, he shall enjoy abundance without fear of evils, which is to be understood as referring to those who already enjoy wisdom in everlasting happiness. Ah. Now, every fear is about some evil, since evil is the object of fear. This is one of them we, we, we skipped over, but evil is the object of fear. So, I must be uh, um, fearing an evil. Maybe I am evil. Therefore, there will be no fear in heaven. This is the objection, so presumably he has the other view. I think there is fear in heaven, actually. Objection two. Further, in heaven, men will be conformed to God. For in 1 John 3, 2, when he shall appear, we shall be like to him. But God fears nothing. Bam. Therefore, in heaven, men will have no fear. Objection three. Further, hope is more perfect than fear, since hope regards good and fear evil. Hmm. Now, hope will not be in heaven. Therefore, neither will there be fear in heaven. So you don't need to hope anymore in heaven. Hmm. However, on the contrary, it is written in Psalms 18, The fear of the Lord is holy, 
Enduring forever and ever. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So how are we going to reconcile these scriptural passages? Aquinas answers that servile fear or fear of punishment will by no means be in heaven since such a fear is excluded by the security which is essential to everlasting happiness. Which I guess uh, we get in heaven. Oh, fortunately, that isn't referenced, but I presume it's a previous question. But regard to filial fear, which we still haven't gotten a definition of, filial meaning either are they relating to parents or brethren? As it increases with the increase of charity, and this is fear on behalf of others, so is it perfected when charity is made perfect. Hence in heaven it will not have quite the same act as it has now. Okay. In order to make this, it's like Dante. Dante was, even though he was, I actually haven't read much of Paradise, but he was certainly, uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure about Paradise. Maybe he didn't have to worry much at all about the people there. He worried about the people in Purgatory and Hell, though. Sometimes too much. In order to make this clear, we must observe that the proper object of fear is a possible evil. Just as the proper object of hope is a possible good. And since the movement of fear is like one of avoidance, fear implies avoidance of a possible arduous evil. For little evils inspire no fear. Now as a thing's good consists in its staying in its own order, so a thing's evil consists in forsaking its order. Maybe that's the essence of why religion has dissolved. The order of good has become non-obvious. Again, the order of a rational creature is that it should be under God and above creatures. Hence, just as it is an evil for a rational creature to submit by love to a lower creature, so too it is an evil for it if it submit not to God by presumptuously revolt against him or condemn him. Huh. An evil for a rational creature to submit by love to a lower creature. Not exactly sure what that is referring to. Now this evil is possible, the revolt, to a rational creature, considered as to its nature on account of the natural flexibility of the free will. Uh, not exactly sure how you're squaring that. <laughs> um, there does seem to be a dichotomy between reason and animality. So we can revolt because we have free will. Whereas in the blessed, it becomes impossible by reason of the perfection of glory. Now that's that's kind of a strange argument. You you can be evil because you're rational and you have free will, but bl the blessed cannot be evil because they have perfected their glory. And uh we would have to uh learn more about glory to understand that 
Therefore, the avoidance of this evil revolt that consists in the non-subjection to God and is possible to nature, but impossible in the state of bliss, will be in heaven. Or I guess the avoidance will be in heaven. While in this life there is avoidance of this evil as something altogether possible. Okay, so when we're in bliss, we won't revolt. This is actually very um, a nice contrast with um, the Vasudhi Maga, which. Uh, we were reading yesterday about happiness and bliss. Bliss being the intensification of uh, everything. Um, hence Gregory expounding the words of Job. The pillars of heaven tremble and dread at his beck. The heavenly powers that gaze on him without ceasing tremble while contemplating, but their awe, lest it should be of a penal nature, is one not of fear but of wonder. Because to wit they wonder at God's super eminence and incomprehensibility. All right, so we're not we don't need to revolt because we're just so astonished. Augustine also says and admits that f admits fear in heaven, although he leaves the question doubtful. If, Augustine says, this chaste fear that endureth forever and ever. Notice that this is again, this is a quote. They're justifying this quote from the Psalms. Just presuming that the Psalms came from God. Um, this chaste fear that endureth forever and ever, if it's in the future life, it will not be a fear that is afraid of an evil which might possibly occur, but a fear that holds fast to a good which we cannot lose. For when we love the good which we have acquired with an unchangeable love without doubt, if it is allowable to say so, our fear is sure of avoiding evil. Because chaste fear denotes a will that cannot consent to sin, and whereby we avoid sin without trembling, lest in our weakness we fall and possess ourselves in the tranquility born of charity. Ooh, a lot of virtues in there. Not sure I fully follow why there would be fear. Somehow the, the, the fear seems to go away when you're in heaven since you're certain it's not there, but he's still calling it fear. Else, if no kind of fear is possible there, perhaps fear is said to endure forever and ever, because that which fear will lead us to will be everlasting. Okay. Maybe you're not totally safe even when you get to heaven. So, what was his answer? So, servile fear won't be there. Filial fear won't be exactly the same. Looks like there might be some kind of fear there. Reply to objection one. The passage quoted excludes from the blessed the fear that denotes solicitude and anxiety about evil, but not fear. The one time I try and use this, it doesn't even come up. Terrible. Not fear which is accompanied by security. That is a strange type of fear. Fear and security combined. 
That seems contradictory. Reply to objection two, as Dionysius says, the same things are both like and unlike God. They are like by reason of a variable imitation of the inimitable. That is because so far as they can, they imitate God who cannot be imitated perfectly. perfectly. They are unlike because they are the effects of a cause of whom they fall short infinitely and immeasurably. Hence, if there be no fear in God, since there is none above him to whom he may be subject, it does not follow that there is none in the blessed whose happiness consists in perfect subjection to God. Well, there, there is the answer of who the blessed are. And yeah, I guess if you have perfect subjection, then you're not going to revolt. And finally, reply to objection three, hope implies a certain defect, namely the futurity of happiness, which ceases when happiness is present. Whereas fear implies a natural defect in a creature, insofar as it is infinitely distant from God, and this defect will remain even in heaven. Hence, fear will not be cast out altogether. So even in heaven, God is still distant. Interesting. Such a rich... Um architecture of virtue and its mechanisms. It just, it's inextricably bound up in belief in the Bible being a direct revelation from God. Without that, um, the core of its argument floats away. I will not forget to actually find my description of virtue here. But this is a nice one, though. Oh, yeah, about the cankers. Okay. Okay, mundane brings improvement in future becoming and is a prerequisite for the escape from becoming, according to his said. This is an interesting kind of sequence. This can be... Uh, compared to the Ta Hyao, the uh, the great learning. In fact, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, Ha Xiao. Wrong books. Okay, yeah, so basically this. So what is virtue? You want to sh you want to show virtue throughout the kingdom. Order your state. You want to order your state, regulate your family. You want to regulate your family, regulate your person. You want to cultivate your person, rectify your heart. You want to rectify your heart, be sincere in your thoughts. You want to be sincere in your thoughts, extend your knowledge to the utmost. Investigate. 
Once you've investigated enough, your knowledge becomes complete. Then your thoughts become sincere. Then your heart is rectified. Then your person is cultivated. Then your family is regulated. Then the state is rightly governed. And then the whole kingdom is made tranquil and happy. So... Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Investigate. Yep. Yep. I was thinking about you and your exclamation point investigates today. Um, okay, so I said that this this description here bears comparison to to that. The uh, great great learning. Let, so let us compare here. So discipline is the purpose of restraint. Restraint is for the purpose of non-remorse. Non-remorse is for the purpose of gladdening. Gladdening is for the purpose of happiness. Happiness is for the purpose of tranquility. Tranquility is for the purpose of bliss. Bliss is for the purpose of concentration. Concentration is for the purpose of correct knowledge and vision. Correct knowledge and vision is for the purpose of dispassion. Dispassion is for the purpose of fading away of greed. Fading away is for the purpose of deliverance. Deliverance is for the purpose of knowledge and vision. Knowledge and vision of deliverance. Knowledge and vision of deliverance is for the purpose of complete extinction of craving through not clinging. Look at that. that I think that's the end. Talk has that purpose, counsel has that purpose, support has that purpose, giving ear has that purpose. That is to say, the liberation of the mind through not clinging. That is the ultimate goal. Oh, oh, this this guy is getting in the way. Sorry. Hanshan has been uh, obstructing us. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, quite a difference. Liberation of the mind through not clinging compared to the kingdom being made tranquil and happy. The rectification of hearts, that does seem related to discipline, which seems to be the root here. It's interesting. So, discipline leads to bliss tranquility and concentration whereas here it's interesting the different notion here is sincerity which doesn't really have um, a correspondence here this is more attuning yourself to the Tao rather than speaking honestly. And it, it presumes that what you need to do is already out there. Whereas this seems to put forward that um, you need to know everything in order to determine what to do, but it's not yet determined. quite a difference this one being more idealistic and and therefore they say the super mundane it's even almost theistic above the normal super normal and everything else comes from that how much zeal you have Um,
Well, the challenge with science is that everything is determined. That's what science operates as its methodological presumption. And technology is the manifestation of that determinism. Where I can turn my stream on and off, I can flick Han Chan on and off exactly as it was. So finding what isn't determined and then squaring that with free will seems to be the greater challenge. Um, which is why also it's interesting that Catholic theology acknowledges the existence of free will here. That's why there can be evil, because we have free will. So I'd be, I'd be curious about um, how free will is explained in um, the Summa Theologica. I still have not found the uh, description of virtue that I, I want to find, though. So I'm, I'm going to zoom ahead. Pure. Okay. Natural virtue. Abstinence. What is the Pratimoka? Where should you live? This is the proper resort. Um, what is proper conduct? This is really cute. This part. Proper conduct. If you jostle elder behikus, sit jostling them, stand in front of them, sit in front of them, sit on a high seat, sit with your head covered, talk standing up, talk waving your arms. That's bad conduct. Walk with sandals while elder behikus walk without sandals. This is very filial. Push elder behikus. Sit while pushing them. Prevent new bihikus from getting a seat. In the bathhouse, asking the elder bihikus to put wood on the stove. Bathes jostling them. Bathe in front of them. All terrible bodily conduct. Isn't that charming? Well, as you can see, what this is page eighty. Look at look at the well-behaved monks here. See, look, no one's jostling anybody. Oops. No one's jostling everyone. He's handing him his sutras. Like this guy, I don't know. He looks a little, a little, you know, suspicious. This guy looks rather grave. You know, no one's jostling anybody. All nice and good bodily conduct. Oh no. Oh no, I was the right place. You know, here's the proper conduct. Wear your inner robe properly. Keep your eyes downcast.
Don't look at elephants. <laughs> Here, here's some ancient wisdom for you. The eye does not see a visible object because it has no mind. The mind does not see because it has no eyes. But when there is the impingement of door and object, he sees by means of the consciousness that has eye sensitivity as its physical basis. Now, an idiom such as this is called an accessory locution. Sasam barakata. Like he shot him with his bow. <laughs> Watch out for the sign of beauty. Don't apprehend laughter. This is a very interesting description of women. The sign of women. What makes up a woman? All such things as the shape that is grasped under the heading of the visible data, materiality, invariably found in a female continuity, the unclear cutness, avisadata, of the flesh of the breasts, curves, the beardlessness of the face, the use of cloth to bind the hair, the unclear cut stance moves. Oh, I, I love this translation here. Look at, look, listen to this. It seems that as the elder was on his way from Chetia Babata to Anur Anuradhapura for alms, a certain daughter-in-law of a clan who had quarreled with her husband and had set out early from Anuradhapura, all dressed up and tricked out like a celestial nymph to go to her relative's home, <laughs> so, saw this monk on the road. And being low-minded, she laughed a loud laugh, wondering, what is that? <laughs> the elder looked up, and finding in the bones of her teeth this tricked-out celestial nymph, the perception of foulness, he achieved our hotship. He basically attained enlightenment. Because this tricked out celestial nymph was walking down the road, came upon him, and was like, Oh, what is that? And then he looks at her teeth, sees them as foul, and then the the allure of women is shattered for him, and he achieves Kendo. Kensho. Kensho. But her husband, who was going after her, saw the elder and asked, Venerable sir, did you by chance see a woman? The elder told him, Whether it was a man or woman that went by, I noticed not. But only that on this high road, there goes a group of bones. You gotta hand it to the, uh, the elder.
I'm gonna find this description. I was tired earlier and I could have come on earlier. I even came home early with the intent of streaming. But it seems so challenging. Yet, I find more edification studying. And I study much harder streaming than I do on my own. Here's a description of snubbing. Yeah. Yeah. I get tremendous satisfaction out of it. It's challenging, though. I was thinking of trying to describe the basic existential predicament of the streamer. You know, it's like it's like you're kind of forced to direct yourself outward. Um which is very distinct from being alone. <laughs> It's not that hard. You think it'd almost be harder than it is, but... Since you project outwards, you get a satisfaction from doing it. I'm amazed just chatting to people works so well. You'd think you'd actually need more sensorial interaction, but just knowing that there's a mind on the other side that then is receiving what you say and then kind of ventriloquizing the mind interaction apparently is enough for both parties. Here's a description of the private parts. Oh, this is why you wear a robe. So they, use, they use Latinate terms, the pudendum. Even if that were so, um... All minds need not be resilient, nor would necessarily a weak mind detract from the stronger. Oh, this is so rigorous. Here's a nice poem. As a hen guards her eggs, or as a yak her tail, or like a darling child, or like an only eye, so you who are engaged your virtue to protect, be prudent at all times, and ever scrupulous.
I don't hear very often that exhortation to vigilantly guard your virtue. Look at this, look at this. These stories are the best part. Here's the story of elders who were bound by robbers in the forest. In Mahavatani forest. Bound an elder with black creepers, vines, and made him lie down. What did he do? Cry, weep, complain? No. While he lay there for seven days, he augmented his insight. And after reaching the fruition of no return, he died there and was reborn in the Brahma world. Oh! Another elder in Tambapani Island was also bound. Then a forest fire came but he established insight and attained nirvana simultaneously with his death. Booyah! Luckily, the elder Abhaya saw his body, cremated it, and built a shrine. Here's a very famous passage from the Buddha. Better bhikkhus, the extirpation of the eye faculty by a red hot burning blazing glowing iron spike than the apprehension of signs in the particulars of visible objects cognizable by the eye. <laughs> now that is a gauntlet. Better to gouge out your eye with a flaming rod than ever put form together with light. It's <laughs> a good question. Well, he must, his body must have been largely intact. You know, it's only a forest fire, just like burned through. So his corpse was there. Maybe his, his rosary. That recommendation of Buddha makes Jesus look like some pansy. Oh. Oh. That is a good question. <laughs> that is an excellent question. This is this is this next one is one of my favorite stories. Maybe my favorite of them all. In the great cave of Kurandaka, it seems, there was a lovely painting of the renunciation of the seven Buddhas. A number of bhikkhus wandering about among the dwellings saw the painting and said, What a lovely painting, venerable sir! The elder said, For more than sixty years, friends, I have lived in the cave, and I did not know whether there was any painting there or not. Now, today, I know it 
through those who have eyes. The elder, it seems, though he had lived there for so long, had never raised his eyes and looked up at the cave. And at the door of his cave there was a great ironwood tree, and the elder had never looked up at that either. He knew it was in flower when he saw its petals on the ground each year. Here's another beautiful story. The elder Mahatisa, it seems, was going on a journey during a famine. And being tired in body and weak through the lack of food and travel weariness, he lay down at the root of a mango tree covered with fruit. There were many fallen mangoes here and there. Uh, he was following the, the, uh, strictures of the Buddha. As the Buddha said in the fire discourse, better behikus, the extirpation, the extermination, the destruction of the eye faculty by a red-hot iron spike than the apprehension of signs and the particulars of visible objects cognizable by the eye. Don't look at what you see. Never look with your eyes. He would sit in that cave and meditate, staring at the ground. Walk out, stare at the ground. He lived there 60 years. He never looked up at this gorgeous painting of the Buddhas, which was on his cave ceiling. For more than 60 years, friends, I have lived in the cave and I did not know whether there was any painting there or not. Now today I know it through those who have eyes. That's his little knock on the fools who use their eye faculty. I continue. So, the elder Mahatisa, he was going through a forest and he was starving, weak in body and mind from traveling. So he lays down at the foot of this mango tree and there are fallen mangoes everywhere. Though ownerless mangoes were lying fallen on the ground near him, he would not eat them in the absence of someone to accept them from. Because as a monk, you only accept what's given to you as charity. You never eat of your own volition. Then a lay devotee who was older than he went to the elder and learning of his exhaustion gave him mango juice to drink. Then he mounted him on his back and took him to his home. 
Meanwhile, the elder admonished himself as follows. Nor your mother, nor your father, etc. Some Buddhist sutra. And beginning the comprehension of formations. Like as, as he, he regains consciousness because he was dying of famine. And augmenting real insight, he realized our hardship. While he was on the guy's back. He achieved enlightenment. Here it is referred to again, like the virtue of the elder Mahatisa, the mango eater, who lived at Chiragumba. The virtue of unlimited purification. Since it is undertaken without reserve and has no obvious limit, such as gain, fame, relatives, limbs, or life. So since he was committed to not violating the precepts without any regard for his life, then the results of the purification had no limit themselves. That is a distinctive Buddhist ambition. Where you aim your ambition at the lack of form in order to magnify its efficacy. Here's some kind of summary. This seems to go over the whole thing. See, we're just going over virtue. What I went over yesterday was the first yana, the first level of accomplishment. Then you go through all the yanas. You get to the summit of existence neither perception nor non-perception then you are in the stream Then you become an Arhat. Well, this is part of it. So what does the virtue get you? Non-remorse, gladdening, happiness, tranquility, joy, repetition, development, cultivation, embellishment, concentration, fulfillment, complete dispassion, Peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nirvana. Oh, okay, here's the defiling of virtue. 
A lot to do with women. Avoid women. This is why it's so useful to disconnect your mind from your eyes. Yay, I finished the first chapter. Okay, so that that was the um, description of virtue. Which I'm not sure I found exactly what I was looking for. Maybe that was it. I thought there was another description though. Next chapter, the 13 kinds of practice. Look at these. These are the professions of the... The... Uh, 4th century monastic world in Sri Lanka. Would you like to become a refuse rag wearer? Where you wear the rags you've gathered from graveyards? Um, would you like to be someone who doesn't eat after noon? Or someone who lives in graveyards? <laughs> All distinct professions. Yeah. Charnel grounds. Where, where they burn people's bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there there is detailed descriptions here of how you meditate with a decomposing corpse. These are all the places you get your rags. There are three grades of refuse rag wearers. Strict, medium, and mild. One who only takes it from a charnel ground, from a graveyard, is strict. One who takes one that was just left behind by someone is medium, and one who takes one that was given to him is mild. Right, here, here, here's, a, here's a rhymed verse on the, the refuse rag wearers. While striving for death's army's rout, the ascetic clad in rag robe clout, got from a rubbish heap, shines bright as mail clad warrior in the fight. This robe the world's great teacher wore, leaving rare kasi cloth and more, of rags from off a rubbish heap, who would not have a robe to keep? Minding the words he did profess when he went into homelessness, let him to wear such rags delight as one in seemly garb bedight. All right. 
Unfortunately. Oh, this is such good stuff. There's always rules about where you get your bowl. It's so wonderful. But no, I don't... I don't think I found what I was looking for. Maybe it is in the first Yana somewhere, and I missed it. It's a good question. Um... Let's see, let's look for the word wash. I think they do wash. Feet washing. Mouth washing. Washing the bowl. You definitely wash your bowl. They dye their robes. They get the robes from the charnel ground, but then they dye them saffron. I think they're pretty clean. Yeah, like here. Sweep the ground, see to the needs of the body, sit down on your seat, give attention to your meditation subject, get up again, take your bowl and robe, go to the ascetic's woods, bliss of seclusion, shade and water, clean and delightful places. Alright, I am going to sleep like a good bahiku but thank you for stopping by i do wish you the best in yourself falling asleep and uh, i will see you later yeah i know sudden right i wish i could stay up but i can't so i won't Thank you. Thank you.